Hey everybody, it's Board Game Blogger. Today I'm here to review Washington's War. It's a kind of an updated remake of the very first card-driven game uh, by Mark Herman, and that is uh, We the People. This is an updated version, which uh, creates a lot of new uh, streamlining mechanisms to really increase the speed of the game. Uh, I'm not sure if those of you who are familiar with the first We the People, I've done a review on it earlier. And there the battle was done through uh, these battle cards. This system is done away with that, and initially I thought I wouldn't like it, but you know it still maintains uh, the ability to create overwhelming odds and you know ensure victory. So it's not it's not very uh, it's not too luck driven and it just it, it streamlines the process like there's there still will be some luck and there, there will be close battles but uh, getting rid of the battle cards just completely streamlines it I think it's an excellent decision and now if both players know the game you can play this game in about two hours which is great uh, you know I I found this is the two-player game I've been playing the most the last three or four months just because it's so accessible. Uh, additionally, the complexity of this game compared to other card-driven games is quite low, and hand management isn't quite as important as in other games such as you know, Twilight Struggle or 1960. There, the order you play the cards in and knowing the potential cards in the game is so much more important that a knowledgeable player has such a distinct advantage over a newcomer or someone who's only played the game two or three times. Not so much here in uh, uh, Washington's War. If, you've, if you're aware of how to play various card-driven games, you can get right into this. And there's not so much memorization. That's because the cards here, most of these cards in the game uh, do not have unique events. But they're, they're rather operational move cards that uh, enable you to move the generals. And because of that, it's just very accessible to get into. Very easy. I really recommend this game. The components are great. Uh, there's both a rule book and a playbook. I really love how GMT has a sample playbook, which after going through the rules, uh, you know, if you're not quite sure, you can still see an actual turn played out. I just, I really love the fact GMT is doing this. It's great. There's also some spectacular player's aids allow quick reference. These are color. They're, you know, made of pretty good quality. It's not a sh just a sheet of flimsy paper. It's, it's, it's pretty strong and sturdy. Uh, it's an excellent, excellent game. Uh, we'll take a closer look at the board and how it's played in the setup, but I love this game because of the, the speed of it. Uh, it looks beautiful. There's a, there's a one minor problem in the game with the production. And that was, uh, there were some markers given to state uh, on the side, just see who's controlling the different colonies. These were misprinted. And unfortunately, GMT uh, hasn't done anything about it. You can get reprints if you buy their magazine, but you know, uh, given how they've done with some other games, I know when they misprinted Twilight Struggle cards, they would then send out the corrected version. I really appreciated that. They seem to have stumbled on this minor issue. I find I just, I'm not even playing with those anymore. Uh, I mean, you can write it down on a chart or, you know, some people use pennies or something, you know, heads means British, tails means American, that sort of thing. It, it's a minor issue, but, uh, you know, sometimes you want to click the glance and see who's in control of the colonies and it's, it's too bad that those were misprinted. But let, let's take a closer look now and uh, see how this great game is played. Okay, so here's the board on setup. Uh, if I zoom in here, we can see the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. And uh, there's some American political control markers. That is how the game is won. It's a slight change from We the People, where We the People, if the British captured Washington, that would be an uh, automatic win for the British. That's been done with, and the Americans can still win without Washington. It's much more difficult to do so, but it is, is possible. So if we take a look over here, here's Washington, 
Howe and Green set up in their initial spots. If you look at Green, there's uh, a one on the top left uh, in, uh, you know, without any symbol or anything. There's a four in this square, and then there's a two and a plus two R. Now those values are important. The one is his strategic rating, and that is the ability to have him move. So he can move on an operations card uh, one, two, or three. Any of those can move him. Whereas if we look here at how, he's got a six for battle rating and a three for strategy rating. So though he's better in battle than green, he needs a three to actually move. He's much slower. And when a battle actually occurs, you first roll and see if you have your full battle rating. And a one to a three gets half your battle rating rounded down, and a four to six gets the full. So it's possible if Green and Howe fought, in addition to the other battle factors, Howe, if he rolled a five and Green rolled a two, Howe would, re re would realize his entire battle rating of six, whereas Green only realizes a two of a battle rating. And that four would just be a massive advantage. Um, and so the way it works, as with no, most card-driven games, is you would have uh, a hand dealt to you of, of seven cards. So here I've randomly picked out seven, and as you can see, they're mostly ops cards, which would let you do one of three things. Activate a general with that strategy rating of equal to that or less. Uh, place a political control marker or bring in a reinforcement into the game. Now, it's asymmetrical in that the British have preset amounts of reinforcements that they can bring in. So, in the first turn, they get three reinforcements to come in. In the second turn, they get eight. The third turn, only one. On the fourth turn, eight again. Whereas, the American player can place two cards per year, per turn, to bring in reinforcements. And the amount of those reinforcements are equal to the value. So they might want to use three value ops to bring in reinforcements. However, in doing so, that limits their ability to use a three ops card to place political control markers. However, most of the American generals can move on just a one or a two, whereas most British generals need a three or at least a two. There's no British general that moves on just a one. As you can see here, if I zoom out slightly, there's this French Alliance track. And what's neat about the French Alliance track is they've changed how the French enter the game as opposed to We the People. In We the People, there was just a Benjamin Franklin signs French Alliance card. There's still a Benjamin Franklin card uh, in this game. Here it is, Benjamin Franklin, Minister to France. And it will move you up on the French Alliance track by four spaces. However, it's not a, a complete entry of the French. The Americans need to be doing other actions. And additionally, if the Americans have been very successful in the game, they don't actually need this card to trigger. So I think it's a much better mechanism to bringing the French into the grain. As you can see, there's nine spaces. And the way the Americans move up is either through this Benjamin Franklin uh, card, which moves it up four spaces, and for each battle that they win, it moves up a space. So if the Americans just plain win nine battles, the French will intervene on their behalf. However, if Washington is captured, then it moves back three spaces. Additionally, if the Americans win such a great battle as to deny the British regulars, that is to destroy three British combat units at any one point in the game, in one single battle, either through inflicting, uh, rolling the dice on a victory and hitting six, that's the only way to do three combat units, or in fact trapping the British and forcing them to surrender. 
and that the British would have no retreat route. So it's, it's a great new French alliance track. So what we would have here is, I'll just play a sample here. So we can see here, if we zoom in, we can see green here has two troops, Washington has five, and Howe has five. So that would be how we're looking at the beginning. So let's say Howe goes first. It's, it's the British. Now normally each turn the uh, American player decides if who wants to go first on the turn. You're both dealt seven cards and you play the cards in order. Uh, let's say the however the American player decided I want to let the British player go first. The British player can supersede the American player's decision to go first, however, if he has a major or minor campaign card. So there is some flexibility there, which is pretty important if the British are trying to capture and isolate uh, a general. But let's say we have, this is how it's starting, and we got a three ops card played by the British. So that is played, and the, that is high enough to actually enable the British to move how? And they can move four spaces carrying five combat units. Let's say they move and attack uh, General Green in Rhode Island. What we can check here is a combat resolution table. And I'm not sure if it's visible or not, but it says, you know, you add up the number of combat units you have, the battle rating, which is determined by the dice roll, as I'd explained earlier, British regulars, Navy support, militia, if it's a winter offensive, and so on. So you add up the factors, you then roll the dice, highest number wins, and then you calculate on the table the combat losses. It might seem a little complicated for someone who hasn't had to chart check before. I know some people are more, you know, Euro style, or they're playing, uh, you know, a card driven game like 1960, and they're not really sure about checking the chart to check combat losses. It's really not that difficult. It's pretty simple. I would really suggest if you're trying to enter some kind of a war game, this one is simple enough to enter and it's, it's just a beautiful, well-produced game. So that would be one way that the British could have used their three ops card. They could have also used it to place three political control markers. So they would place them on the board. Let's say they place them here, here, and here. This now gives them two of the three cities in New Hampshire and control of that colony. And that it would be important for determining militia for the various battles and for winning the game at the end of the game. Now the British need to control six colonies to win the game, I believe, whereas the Americans need to control seven colonies. However, the Americans could count Canada as one of those colonies. And it, what you do is you check at the end of each turn, you know, if, if the war has ended. There's a, like in the We the People game, there's Lord North's government falls. He was the Prime Minister of England at the time and then the game can end in that year. The first year that the war can end is 1779 through Lord North's government falling. That's the earliest card. So while after 1779 you have to be prepared for the war potentially ending every year. So there, there's a neat uh, you know, balancing factor in that. I know some people try and really play the long game and they're like, you know, okay, 1780 I'm prepared, you know, I've got everything planned out to, to win in 1782, but I, I can't just ignore the present because the, the game can just end right then. It can't end too early. It's got that earliest cutoff of 1779, so I think it's a, it's a good mix right there. As I said, most of the cards are, uh, are just numbered opses or, you know, major or minor campaign. 
So it's pretty easy to get into, and there's not an advantage to the other player in memorizing some of these other cards, or as much matter in the hand management. There are other cards, though, such as here, Henry Knox, uh, Continental Artillery Commander. The American player could play this in battle at the time of battle to give him plus two to his dice modifier. However, because it's an American event, let's say it had been dealt to the British player. The British player can discard it uh, you know, during the battle if he was holding it for just a, a one modifier, or he can discard it at another time to play it kind of as a, as a one ops card in order to you know, place his own political control marker or in fact take away uh, an American political control marker. And that's the only way you could take him away except through other event cards. There's also political isolation that happens in the game. I'll zoom in here to give an example of political isolation. So right now we see there's an American political control in Hillsboro, North Carolina. Right now it is not isolated because it can draw to either an empty space or an, if there was an American combat unit here, it could draw to an American combat unit. It's safe. Additionally, if it can draw to the Continental Congress, it is safe. Those are the ways that it's not isolated. Let's say, however, the British had placed political control markers here. At the end of the turn, now suddenly, uh, the, there's no line to a free, uh, free city in which the American's not isolated. So now at the end of the turn, this American political control is isolated because he's surrounded by Tories. And it does, it's not that it flips to British, but it's just they, they lose you know, their, their support there. If, however, there was American combat units here, then it's not isolated. And because the combat units, you know, prop up the, the locals enough that they, uh, they're steadfast in the, the faith uh, and the cause to liberty. That's how isolation works. And what happens is American units are isolated prior to British. That is, uh, the, uh, not the units, sorry, but rather the political control is isolated first. And so because of that, even though the British might have been isolated, if they can isolate and remove an American first, that might free up an empty space that enables them to not be isolated. Furthermore, British units are never isolated in port spaces, such as here, as we can see a port. So ports are incredibly important in the game because that is where the British can bring in reinforcements. They can only bring in reinforcements to a port. They can move via port. Uh, they have the British Navy gives them additional battle factors during a battle done in a port and they're not isolated so they're incredibly important and the British player will focus a lot on that. Uh, there's also different attrition rates at the end of the year and at the end of the year every American uh, general and his combat units are reduced down to half uh, than what, what they were. That is except those for Washington uh, just because of you know his ability at Valley Forge to keep the army together instead of most Americans you know they'd only enlist for the year and they would have to go home at the end of the year whereas the British were a professional army and if as long as the British can stay in winter quarters which is signified by a square or south of the winter attrition line so here we see Richmond has sufficient winter quarters whereas Petersburg does not so if the British had ended the year with, say, two units in General Clinton in Richmond. If he ended the year there, he would be fine. If, however, he ended the year in Petersburg, he would have to lose half his troops down to one. So where you end the year is very important. Uh, General Washington also has uh, a year-end attack ability, sort of, you know, when he surprised the, the Hessians at Trenton, is what that's supposed to recreate. 
And it's neat because normally, you know, it's tough for Washington to take on, you know, Howe, just because Howe has that six battle rating. So if, if Howe's full up on troops in, in, you know, in a port space where the British have militia, you probably don't want to be attacking there. And it, it's, it's just a neat game uh, because of the, the asymmetry within the two, the two opposing parties. You know, the British, they get, a, they get troops uh, early, you know, a lot of powerful troops, but then they're hard limited. And if, if they suffer too many defeats, you know, not only have they lost those troops permanently, but that they also, you know, the French will have intervened on the Americans' behalf. And the British are usually better at fighting the battles, though. They all have higher battle ratings, but lower also higher strategy ratings, which makes them more difficult to move around. So, you know, there's, there's pros and cons on both sides. I think it's an interesting game. Again, two hour playing time is magnificent. Rules and the components besides the, the state markers here, this is where they would go, the misprinted ones I was telling you about. Uh, I've got them in a baggie right here. I don't know if it comes up on the video, but they've just been misprinted. And, you know, both sides would show American on some of them, and it's just, it's a mess. So I, I find it's better to not deal with that and just, you know, calculate up as you go. Uh, the, I'm sure there's a few little minor rules I'm, I haven't uh, talked about, but, you know, there's not too many. The game isn't fiddly at all. And I really suggest picking up a copy of this, uh, especially if you're a fan of the older We the People game or any card driven strategy in general. I'd say it, you know, you would love it. Um, additionally, if you're wanting to enter a card driven strategy game and you're, you're wondering, you know, what game to try out initially, this is the game to do it in. It's, uh, you know, even if you're not uh, American, you know, if you're uh, European or, or someone from the Commonwealth, it, it's still, I think, a great game to enter into. You don't really need to know the background of the American Revolution to enjoy the game. It's still a, a, you know, a great war game on its own. Uh, and though there is some, you know, you'll be learning as well through it. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic game. I, I really can't say anything higher than that. You know, it's, it's the game I've been playing the most for the last three or four months. And uh, if you don't have it, I'd recommend picking up a copy. Again, if you're uh, you know, a pure Euro gamer, you probably wouldn't like this game. You know, there is dice, there is some luck, some luck in the cards that you're dealt. And if you're one of those players who just can't handle luck at all, like you'll have to stay away from this game. But uh, I would say the game's about you know, 85% strategy, 15% luck you know, on, on the, the average game. You know, some, some games could vary just the luck could go, you know, the dice completely go against you, that can always happen. But I, I find it's pretty rare. And it's, again, it's a pretty short game if both players already know the rules and how to play. Two hour play time just fits perfectly. I can't, uh, can't recommend this game highly enough. Uh, go out and get it. Uh, Till next time. Uh, I'm the board game blogger.